We've been fighting a long time. We have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. <coughs> Welcome everybody back with Steve Cunningham with Sense for Daily Income with you another resistance podcast with Friar Anthony. We're gonna talk about manliness. Probably have welcome back. We had you on last week about the pre-55 and talk a lot of guys talked about how manly that was, but the virtues of manliness. Yeah, the virtues of manliness. Um, it's um a lot of times in America we talk about uh, we talk about manliness from a perspective of shooting guns and going out in the woods and wrestling and stuff like that. And even working with youth, uh, we were able to start here, the Marian Seraphic Youth. The bishop gave permission for a, um, a project that I just started called Marian Seraphic Youth. It's working with kids. But it's, it's, based on, uh, it's based on virtue. And there's a lot of programs that are out there right now where they work with boys, and they really try to force this the manliness you know, this masculinity, which is important because you, you, you see, not to offend any millennials, but, uh, you know, I get a lot of millennials coming here making visits and things like that. And this, they, they tell me this isn't such an easy life to live because the beds are made out of wood. And, uh, it's cold in the house or it's hot in the summer. You eat stale bread and stuff like that. So just a lot of penance, you know, but the, um, but the effeminacy that you find in the young men today, they don't even know that they're effeminate. So what is effeminacy? Effeminacy is just this desire for luxury. Um, those cell phones that everybody has now that is a computer and you can check everything in, that's, that's effeminate. It's effeminate in the sense that people will say after they use one for a short amount of time that they can't live without it. They can't live without it because it, has, it gives them everything that they want. And you find that people today, they use their lower faculties. What's that mean? Um, we have higher faculties of our soul. We have lower faculties of our soul. The higher faculties are our intellect and our will, right? And we, 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 that's our studying. Sitting down at nighttime, we, we study something. We learn something. And then we're able to use that information that we have to make choices, choices that lead us hopefully uh, more and more into uh, the imitation of Christ more and more into the love of God so that all of our actions are more and more directed towards perfection. But the lower faculties have to do with our sensuality and we want to be fed. We want to hear things. We want to see things. We want to taste things. We want to be comfortable. We want to deny ourselves penance. We, we don't want to deny ourselves uh, luxury. And this is what effeminacy starts to become. And a lot of millennials don't even know that they're effeminate. You know, because they grow up, many millennials grow up today. And again, I'm not trying to offend millennials, but I found, you know, there's millennials that come here and uh, they, have, they have hearts of gold and they give something very, they want to give everything to our Lord. Then they're here for less than 24 hours and they'll be weeping, saying they have to go home. And you're like, why? They miss their family. They're tired. They're hungry. They're this and that. And they, 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 you know, the, the, the list goes on. But you prick them. You just prick them a little bit because they're so used to having soccer teams where you don't keep score. This is a very interesting thing. You, you grow up with a, a group of, of, of young men that you don't have to keep score. You tell everybody they're great. They're going to change the world. It's amazing when you sit down with a group of young people and you give them catechism and you just look at them all and you say, don't buy into it. You, you're, you're not going to amount to anything. And they, <laughs> they all look at you like, 
what did you, you just said we're not going to amount to anything. It's like, we, everybody tells you you're going to change the world. You're not going to change the world. Nobody changes the world. And even if you do change the world, they'll make some statue and put you in some square somewhere. And an hour after you're dead, everybody's going to ask, who's that? And everybody's going to say, I don't know. You know, so it doesn't even matter. You're not really going to change the world. We've lost, we've lost track on what is the end of our existence here on earth. And we know it's a simple answer. Our end for our existence here on earth is to love, know, and, and please God. We want to go to heaven because this life will end. Everybody watches it. We all know people who have died. And even if you don't know somebody who's died, all you have to do is pick up a history book and realize everybody who's in that book is no longer alive, right? That's a lot of people because nobody outlives life. Everybody dies eventually. So there's what happens at the end of that life. And that's why we're here to get to the end of that life. Manliness, when, when I mentioned that they, they work with the different boys, like these camps, these programs that they'll get, a lot of these lay people and even the clerics that start these programs for boys, they have a very good intention. Mm -hmm. They see this effeminacy that is so rampant in our culture. Now, I just want a side note. When I talk about, when we're talking about manliness, we don't really just mean for men. There's a manliness for women. Not. The manliness is for women. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not. A, it's not. Um, what's that called when ladies are crazy? It's um, uh, feminism. Feminism. It's not feminism. We're talking about. We're not. We're not saying that women should start acting like men, because humanity, a man. When we talk about the scripture, beatus vir, we're not just talking about a man, like a, a masculine, a male. We're talking about a member of the human race. God made them male and female, and he called them man. He called them man. He called them Adam, right? Man. But that's male and female. But male and female, they have their different components. You know, women make up that, that other portion of humanity, and men make up the other portion of, of, of humanity, and that's what man is. In Scripture, when it talks about the holy women, the virgins, or sometimes the um, really the... Uh, the non-virgins in most cases, it, it, there's a there's an antiphon, I think it takes it from wisdom, it talks about um, a woman with a manly heart, mm -hmm. with a manly heart. So these ver this, this, this manliness that, that we're talking about is, is also necessary for, it's for both sexes according to God's plan, God's desire for males and God's desire for females. Mm -hmm. But that, that masculinity, it, 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 in it's the same when we say femininity. Mm -hmm. The outcome's the same. It, it's a heroic. It's a heroic entering into who God wants you to be. But so when we when they take these boys out and they have these these programs for boys, at least I'll talk about that. They they tend to do a lot of tough things, things that we would think men would go do. They're going to have them shoot guns and they're going to they're going to have them make fires. And I do the same thing with the boys. You take them out, teach them how to make fires, and you teach them how to play with knives. When we say play with knives, but you know, use knives. And how to do how to do Planet. things? Yeah, they, they need to get dirty. They need to cut themselves. And you, you need to not cut themselves. I mean, the psychologists will be listening, and next thing, <laughs> but, yeah, but, but, yeah. <laughs> but they need you know they need opportunities where they can they can take risks, uh, but but risks that are sound, you know, because men young boys take risks. That the, the Ferdinand the Third he he used to tell his soldiers to go out and, when they weren't in a time of war to go out and do dangerous things because they had to keep that, they had to stay on edge. They had to be able to respond to things. They couldn't get slushy and dull, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what you need to do with boys. But these programs, if they center too much only on external activity is what manliness is, they've missed everything. Because manliness has to do, when we talk about beer, beer, the word in Latin, beer is man. But virtue, the root of the word virtue is vir, virtus, virtus. So virtus is, is virtue, and virtues are powers, they're strengths. And if you go and you look at St. Paul, it's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He talks about a couple different places, but really chapter 11. That's where he's talking about glorying in his, in his dishonor. If you go through and you look at everything that St. Paul has to glory in, it's getting stoned. It's getting beaten. It's getting shipwrecked. 
It's being in peril all the time. It's being hungry and thirsty and kicked out and being alone. I mean, it, it, it's just a whole list of things that we, we can't take. We, as soon as it happens, we cry out and say, why has God abandoned me? And whereas St. Paul says, this is my glory. And then, then, and then even though God had done all that with St. Paul, St. Paul goes on and says, and he gave me a sting in my flesh. We don't exactly know what that means. Some scripture scholars talk about maybe it was a type of like, they call it the foco di San Antonio, or to the um, shingles, or it could have been something else. But we don't know what it was. Some people say it might have been the stigmata because he says, and I bear the I bear the wounds of our Lord, which really probably was all the beatings that he took. I mean, when you get stoned and they leave you outside the, the village, they presume you're actually dead. Yeah. Right. And he got stoned and left outside the village and he wasn't. And well, he might have been dead, but he rose up and walked back into the village. It sounds to me like a miracle. But you can tell he was probably a bit crippled in his older age from being you know, when they, when they, when they whip you five times, he got five times, he got scourged one One times enough to, to hurt you pretty bad. And three times he got flogged with, with, with sticks, right? He got flogged. That can cripple you too. He got three times being shipwrecked, floating in the sea. You can imagine the health problems they had. (laughs) Stones don't help the cause. (laughs) I mean, yeah. And he walked, he walked everywhere. He referred to these as his, his glories. And so, he got a sting in the flesh, whatever that was. He prayed that God might take it away. And we know what the answer was. My grace is sufficient for you. Why would we respond to that? God's abandoned me. We would goes down. Everyone's losing it. Yeah. Yeah. Too bad. Too bad for God. I'm going to go do my own thing now because, he, because we see God as a teddy bear who's supposed to give us everything we ask for. Mm-hmm. See, see it that way. St. Paul, when he's glorying, in, in his letters to all his good faithful, trying to encourage them, he's glorying in all the things that everybody hates. Uh-huh. We need to bring it back to us Americans. Hey, you hear the uh, offer it up, but right when you, it, it sounds good when you say it, but when it's time to do it, uh, nobody really wants to do that. That's the thing. I mean, we ha- I mean, this is for anybody who might be listening to this is we're all, we've all been there. We all sit there at mass. We hear the, the strong homily and we're all convicted that, He's not talking about me. <laughs> I'm one of the faithful. I'm one of the faithful. And we just kind of, we, we convince ourselves and we, we help ourselves really, uh, you know, we comfort ourselves in the fact that we're being faithful. As soon as we get pricked, as soon as the cancer comes, as soon as the, you know, whatever the ailment is, comes and hits us right now, and we're, we're convalescent in a bed. That's when we're tried. That's when the manliness comes out. But to get back to the main point, if to be a man is to be virtuous, then it doesn't have to do with being tough and having muscles and being able to do all these other things. It has to do with growing in likeness of Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ, when they talk about Christ, they would touch the hem of his cloak and virtue would go forth from him, virtue, power. And St. Paul refers to when I'm weak, I'm powerful. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And St. Paul tells us we are called to imitate him. He says, be imitators of me. Well, we know that the Christian perfection, um, the all spirituality is wrapped up in imitation of Christ. Mm-hmm. But St. Paul believed that he was imitating Christ perfectly. And I, I, he gives us a magnificent example of what that means. It means basically being seen and living as a complete and utter failure in this world. Mm-hmm. Every St. Paul lists in scripture, it's as though he failed everything. Mm-hmm. He went, he, he, he was in prison writing these letters. He's in prison. Yeah. Lost his freedom. He's been beaten so many times. He, he's been cast out by his own people. He's been in peril from the Gentiles, peril from his brethren, the Jews, peril from the other Christians, peril from everyone. And yet he's always on the run. He gets kicked out of every town. Everywhere he goes, there's a tumult. They're sending, um, the Judaizers, these were the Christians who still believed in circumcision. They're sending them after him to try to undo everything he's done in every single town. Most men that are listening to this, if they would be faced with even just a minuscule amount of hardship that he had to face, would have given up and turned back. But the point was, as St. Paul saw the end, 
The end's Christ. Life ends. St. Paul knew that every person who had ever lived had died. And the end of our life is Christ. And Christ triumphed over death. So now our whole life is to die and be risen with Christ. And if that means we have to imitate Christ, that means to grow in perfection with Christ. And so what we receive in the sacraments, especially baptism and then and then abundantly, uh, well, we should say, in the, that more active way through our confirmation, we receive that outpouring of grace so that we can, we can build on these virtues. Now, virtue essentially is us doing, we, we need grace for it. We need grace so that we can do a good thing supernaturally. Because there are, there are virtues that are natural, and there are virtues that are supernatural. And you can have the same virtue in the natural realm that you have in the supernatural realm. Here in Kentucky, they have a license plate that, that it's for the Freemasons, and it says, it says, making good men better. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that. Oh, it's absolute nonsense. Make good men better, right? Because they don't believe, they don't believe in, in, in grace. They, they believe, they believe in raising yourself up with your own, by your own bootstraps. They, they believe uh, in, in natural, natural religion that they've, that they've formed, right? Mm -hmm. But that's nonsense. We can't do anything good without God's help. And God offers us this constant grace so that we can do the good that's necessary, but we have to cooperate with that. And grace builds on nature. And so we have to keep practicing a virtue, something you practice over and over and over. Being charitable isn't something you just wake up. God infuses the charity in your soul, which he does, but it doesn't mean you just start being charitable to everybody. Uh, St. Paul goes, when, when he talks about it, he says, um, let me read it to you. I think he talks about being, when you're, when you're buffeted. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take from you, if a man be lifted up, made made higher than you or be, be, be privileged or honored in your presence. If a man strike you in the face. So whenever these difficulties befall us, we are completely indignant. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll go so far if our parish priest says something to us that upsets us or does something that we don't like, we'll get an attorney. Mm -hmm. like, what? You'll get an attorney against your father. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you might have a, you might have a parish priest who's not even holy, but he's still your father. You might have a father who's not holy, but doesn't give you a right to sue your father and to throw him into. No, you love your father. And what it shows is Christians today, we think we think with worldly wisdom. Mm -hmm. We don't think with supernatural wisdom. We don't turn the other cheek. We say we would, and we believe if a Muslim came up and and hit me, I'd turn the other cheek. No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think that would happen then because you're not going to do it for a Christian brother. You won't do it for your own family members, and you won't even do it for your own priest mm -hmm. if you're. He says something you don't like in the homily, you're immediately taken to write the letter to the bishop to shut him down. Mm -hmm. Some of the traditional Catholics you have here, you know, listening, they're not going to do that because they, they're, they're going somewhere where, you know, they're getting fed usually pretty good. But in this coronavirus, what if you have a parish priest that you think should be risking his neck? By giving everybody the sacraments, they should be opening the church, even though the bishop said no. They should be offering mass for you mm -hmm. when the bishop told him, told him he's not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So you start to slam the one person who really does care about you, your parish priest, and you start destroying him. Mm -hmm. Where's the Christian? Where's the rudiment Christianity in your soul? See, the virtue of charity has to be, it has to be made to where you have this docility of a little child. And little children do not act like ven venomous servants. But that's what Christians start to act like. The best text I've ever had so far from a priest. I was writing this priest in France. I was trying to do a podcast on Blessed uh, Noel Pignot, uh, one of the French Revolution, the first martyr, I think, of the, of the priest. He went up to the altar and, and all his guard going on, entering Trebo, entering Trebo, a tare day to get his head cut off. And... Uh, so he, he sends me his numbers to text me through WhatsApp. And I go, Father, this is Steve from uh, uh, the emails we've been, uh, we've been communicating with. And he responds back, son. And I go, and th I, I read it going, man, that was such a good text back. I called him, <laughs> I called him son. I hope he doesn't feel like he was. Uh, in, I wonder who would get insulted over that. Yeah. 
But yeah, he's he's your father. He's your father. And even if you know, even if we want to jump on boat with the process and say you can't call any man father, whatever else, but we know what it means. He feeds us spiritually. He gives birth to us in the baptismal font, you know. He feeds for us with the Father. He raises us from the dead when we sin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we're we're gonna we're gonna lash out and say, You've done me wrong. It's like ha- have a little bit of patience. Have a little bit of patience. Send him a card. Send him a card and tell him, tell him you're gonna do extra sacrifices and penances for him, you know? Mm-hmm. This is the state, this is kind of the state we're in. But but the virtue, the virtue is the building up of graces. If you're gonna be if you're gonna be solid in your femininity or solid in your masculinity, it's because you are solid in your virtues. Mm-hmm. This is, this is the beauty of, of masculinity or femininity. It's, and that's what being manly is. When you look at, uh, there's a few encyclicals written about St. Francis. Uh, it, they, they wrote a lot about St. Francis, especially the Third Order. But it was uh, Leo the Thirteenth, Benedict the Fifteenth, and um, Pius XI. They wrote some beautiful encyclicals on, on St. Francis. And in those, in those uh, encyclicals, they refer to, as they say in St. Paul, to be imitators of me. That's Philippians 3, uh, 17. So, so in St. Francis, they referred to St. Francis as the risen Lord in his own lifetime. They referred to him as the risen Lord, another Christ. Um, and so the, the holy pontiffs were referring to St. Francis by way of imitate him because he was the the vir catholicus et apostolicus. He was the Catholic and apostolic man. Mm-hmm. That's magnificent to hear. Because St. Francis was, in, was given by Our Lady. He was, he was imbued by Our Lady. He prayed that she would take him as his advocate, that, 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 Saint, that Our Lady would be his advocate. And in doing so, when she responded, I mean, when she answered his prayer, it says St. Bonaventure says in chapter 3 of the, the, the major life, mm-hmm. He says that Our Lady conceived in St. Francis the gospel way of life. The way of life. That, that means that the perfect way of imitating Christ. That, that was what he was imbued with. And then Our Lady brought it to, con, to, to fruition. She gave, she gave birth, as it were, to this, this Franciscan way of life, which is the gospel way of life, to live just like our dear blessed Lord on earth. And when St. Francis even went to, uh, when he went to the Vatican to talk to the Pope about it, they were like, you can't, you can't do that. It's no man can really live that way. It's too much. Mm-hmm. And the Cardinals went up and said, excuse me, but if, if you're going to say that, if you're going to say that it's too much to live the gospel, then we have to say the apostles didn't do it either. And we have to deny scripture. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh yeah, that's good. That's a good point. Good point. So then they gave permission for the life, and it revolutionized, not revolu- revolutionized in the opposite sense. Right, right. It, it brought everyone to their senses to, to a time where there was great effeminacy. Mm-hmm. We don't realize it, but at that time there was great affluency. There was, there was peace for the most part. Mm-hmm. People had luxury. It was very much, according to Leo the Thirteenth, if he has any authority whatsoever, and according to Benedict the Fifteenth and Pius the Eleventh. They all say the time that St. Francis lived in is very similar to our time. Mm-hmm. With that, uh, that affluency, with that luxury that they had. I mean, St. Francis was walking around before he was St. Francis. He was walking around in fine garments, fine clothing. He liked luxury. He was treating his friends to great banquets. You know, they, they didn't work a whole lot. He was a good salesman, but they didn't work a whole lot. They were always going out eating and feasting and dressing up well and you know, living the high life. Was it his, weren't they call him Francis because of that? It's kind of like a mocking in a way. No, they called him Francis because his dad, his name was Giovanni. And then his, because his mother, his father was away when he was born in the baptismal font is San Rufino. He was baptized Giovanni and then John. And, and then when the father got back, he was on, he was on in France because he was doing business with the French. His, the wife, they seemed to peak God, the mother, she was probably also French. And so he loved the French people, and he was there buying fabric from them because they made the best fabric, I guess. And so he's bringing that back. And when he got back, he was so happy with his business dealings in France, he renamed St. Francis or Giovanni Francesco. Yeah. So he named him Francesco. 
And we don't know in history of anybody named Francis before St. Francis. Huh. Yeah. So he, it seemed that he got the name because of that. But because his mom was French, his dad loved the French, his name was Francis. St. Francis also loved singing French songs and, and other things like that. He was a very uh, jovial young man. He was virtuous, though. He, he was a sinner, but he was virtuous. But the, the popes, they, they point this in the direction of imitating St. Francis. Mm -hmm. What is that imitation? The imitation of St. Francis is perfect imitation of our dear blessed Lord. Mm -hmm. And that through reading the scriptures, for following the scriptures, for implementing the scriptures. And the thing that dawned on St. Francis was, well, let's look, at, let's look at our dear blessed Lord. How did he live? He lived, he was born into nothing. The only, the treasure that he took, the treasure that he took was his mother. He prepared the greatest treasure, the greatest throne, and that became his entry into the world and his mother, his greatest treasure, the immaculate. That was the only treasure he took. And then he added to that treasury, the beauty of St. Joseph, mm -hmm. a virtuous man. But you look at St. Joseph, St. Joseph, like let's look at St. Joseph in the way St. Joseph lived manliness. And the way an American does it. Mm -hmm. St. Joseph worked as a carpenter. And Mary of Agreda and other, other great uh, mystics refer to St. Joseph as that he, he worked in a way where he, he didn't ever charge anybody for his labor. What he would do is he would, he would take the commission or whatever it was. He would build the table or whatever he was supposed to build. And then he would, he would give them the table and he would leave it to them to pay him out of justice. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine people took advantage of him, and he didn't do anything. So they lived poor because St. Joseph was probably a very fine carpenter, but we know from Scripture he was considered a poor carpenter. Mm -hmm. they, they speak of him in kind of a disparaging way. Isn't he the son of the carpenter? But St. Joseph was a poor carpenter because he didn't charge people for what his work was worth. He believed and trusted in God's providence. And this is the way our Lord wanted to live. He lived a way to show us how we were to live. And then later he talks about it. They were to be like the birds, you know, the flowers of the field and the birds of the air. And we're to, to rely on our heavenly father. St. Francis wanted to be that. He wanted to be this butterfly that just didn't have anything or worry about anything because he believed his good father, our father in heaven, would provide for all of his needs. Now, St. Joseph, let's look at St. Joseph and then the, the working man today. St. Joseph worked because it's sanctifying. And that's why we have St. Joseph the worker Oh, in, in opposition to the communism, that work does sanctify. Because even in the Garden of Adam and Eve, they were supposed to work. Mm -hmm. But they didn't work by the sweat of their brow. That was a, that was a punishment afterward. Now, that punishment wasn't given to women. <laughs> you see, it's like a double punishment. Women want to go to work now because they want to, they want to take part in the punishment of men. Men have to go because they're punished by that. They didn't have to deal with the punishment of you know, feeling the pains of labor. They, they shouldn't have to suffer the sweat, sweat of your brow. But then men today, instead of like what St. Joseph did, he, St. Joseph longed to go to work to sanctify himself. Mm -hmm. Then he looked for justice sake, pay me what you think it's worth. Mm -hmm. Men today want to do half the work of what it's worth. And they want to be, they want to be paid three, four times more because they want to have the nest egg. Mm -hmm. because they want to go on vacation because they want to have a car that has all these, you know, everything in it. Cameras that show them all kinds of stuff when they're backing up. I don't know. No, I remember picking up a guy when I did Uber. He was he just got out of college, and no kidding, I remember the quote in the back seat. He was talking to some you know, his coworker. Yeah, I expect to make six figures next year. He just got hired. <laughs> I wanted to smack him. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Yeah, but th there's an there's an effeminacy with it because what we long for, we just long to live this. We long for this life. Mm -hmm. Long to fill our life with things of this life. We, we, we justify, good Catholics, justify being able to treat ourselves to stuff. I, you hear good Catholics go out to a restaurant, not in these days, but you know, normally, go out to a restaurant and they'll complain because they should have given me enough food to be able to take home. Or they'll get mad because the person didn't refill their soda 15 times yeah. or whichever part of the country you're listening to. They, there's always some kind of complaint. You know, but you go over to the you go over to like the Philippines or something like that, 
they, they make a bowl of rice for you and they put a dead fish on it and you that's what you eat and you're like this is great you know you put a little bit of salt on it and you eat your fish and your dead you eat your dead fish and your and your, and your rice over over here it's like I paid fifteen dollars I expect I expect a take home box I expect my, my, my I'm not going to leave that lady anything yep. where's your charity good Christian soul yep and so we we strive for the the top of the top and all as we are really is birds with little with little strings attached to our feet, what we do is we tie ourselves down to this world. So where's our virtue? It's virtue. And when we start growing in the virtue, we start detaching from everything that's of this world. And that's when we start preparing for heaven. People don't understand it. They think I have to live, be good, do my best, die and go to heaven, right? No, you're here. You are here to grow in virtue, which is imitation of Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ of the world and chose to be born in a stable. He didn't have any place to call his own. Then immediately they had to flee and go into Egypt, where St. Mary of Great even talks about the fact that, that our blessed, the Blessed Virgin would, would pray that the sun would beat on them more rigorously because they want to do penance. They wanted to make reparation for other people's sins. This is what we Christians should be doing, not worrying about how much money we're going to make so we can prove to people how blessed we are. That is constant mentality. Mm -hmm. Yes. If God wants to give us a lot of money in the job that we do, we do that job only for the love of God. We live poorly like the Holy family and we use our money to help the church. I love it. Or I actually hate it. When you hear Christians, good Christians, traditional Catholics who will complain about the vestments mm -hmm. and then ask them, have you ever bought any vestments for the, Parish, have you ever helped out? Have you ever thought to buy a linen, uh, donate some money to Father to get a, a nice linen for the altar for our Lord? Have you ever thought to donate and, and spend the money to get a better tabernacle? You know, that, that everybody wants to complain it's and they easy. want to spend their money, but nobody wants to spend their money for our Lord. They all want to say, but our Lord lived in poverty, so our, you know it's, it's wrong to have these churches. Now, traditional Catholics don't say that. But you still do get a lot of people who think it. You know, they're okay. It's okay for them to have a really big house. But it's not okay if the parish priest needs a million dollars to renovate, not renovate, but to even change the roof that's leaking. Mm -hmm. You know? It's easy to complain. It's hard to build. It's hard to do penance. It's easier to complain. And it, what it is, is it's, 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 our lack of, it's our lack of imitating our Lord. Mm -hmm. Imitating on the fact of how did he live his life? He went into a town. He had nowhere to even lay his head. You know, pe people, you know, the, the apostles were sent out two by two, and they weren't allowed to take anything with them because they had to rely on the providence of God. We were afraid to rely on the providence of God. We think we have to provide for ourselves, and when we're provided well, we thank God's providence, mm -hmm. which is really very sad because God, since he is all providential, meaning if he, if he stops providing for us at any moment, we wouldn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. That's how he provides, how intimately he wants to provide for us. And it's one of the beauties that St. Francis gave to the world is that Franciscans, if they live authentically their vocation, they're to beg for their food. Mm -hmm. They rely on charity because they fulfill that blessing for people. Whatever you did for the least of my brethren, you did unto me so that they will never receive that curse that our Lord says in Matthew 25, that um, the par parousia, when, the, when our Lord comes back and he puts all the sheep and the goats on either side. So the way to grow in this manliness isn't, isn't to read each individual scripture and try to, you know, it's to read, it's to read all of scripture understanding who is our dear blessed Lord. And praying to our dear blessed Lord, how do you want me to, especially for the men, mm -hmm. how do you want me to do my work? How do you want me to live with the family in, in austerity of some sort and use our money for the upbuilding of the faith, for the promulgation of the gospel? Mm -hmm. Now, maybe the families can't go out and evangelize. They have to evangelize with their lives. They, they may not be able to go to work and speak about you know, go go to the water cooler and just start talking about our Lord and whatever. Maybe it's not going to work in some people's work environment. Some people are able to do that. Some people might not be. But our, our baptismal and especially our confirmation grace gives us a special grace 
to be Christ in the world. Mm -hmm. But that's only noticeable through our virtues. Mm -hmm. Unless we're developing our virtues, living our virtues, then people start to see in us, there's something different about you because they see Christ. Mm -hmm. They see you imitating Christ. And then they ask you, and then you make a response. But for people that can't, maybe that doesn't happen, your resources, your money is to be used to help those people who can go do that. It's to help the church build beautiful structures, to have beautiful vestments, um, to, to, to help these channels out that evangelize people. This is what we should be doing to help everybody rebuild the church. Now Catholics want to say that they're just so leery about where the money's being spent. They don't want to give money to anybody. Oh, but you're still going to spend it on yourself. You're not going to set it aside for anything. That's just one little aspect. But the point is, is to, to start living according to the life of our Lord, seeing how he lived, seeing how he died. He didn't have anything. In the end, he, he died with nothing. In his, in his journeys, he had nothing. He sat down and asked that woman at the well, give me to drink. He, and he was tired. Mm -hmm. When he fell asleep, when he fell asleep in the boat, you remember there's a storm? Mm -hmm. Why did he fall asleep? Because he was just playing around. See, we don't sort out the fact that he would stay up at nighttime. Mm -hmm. He would do battle with his own flesh, even though he had no concupiscence. Mm -hmm. This is what we, he's showing us what we're supposed to be doing. We have concupiscence. What it means is we have disordered attachment or inclinations towards sin, mm -hmm. towards, uh, towards our passions, Right. Well, we have to do battle with that. So we have our flesh and we have our spirit. The way we start growing in these virtues is we see the flesh desires to have my Coca-Cola refilled 15 times while I'm there because I want to get the most out of my dollar fifty. Mm -hmm. I want to have the biggest burger I can get, and I, I, I have a yearning for a hamburger today. And so I'm going to go to this one restaurant that I've been thinking about for a couple of days, and I'm going to satisfy that yearning, right? That's the, from the flesh. The more the flesh asks us to do things, the more the flesh says, just hit the alarm button and go back to sleep for a couple more minutes. Mm -hmm. Just just snap at that person because you need to show them that they shouldn't be talking to you that way. The flesh tells us what we should do, but now we, we know in our intellect because we study it, because we pray about it, because we reflect on it, what would be the virtuous thing to do? And then it, with our will, we have to now make a decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to have... Am I going to have 15 Coca-Colas at this meeting at lunch? Do I really have to go to that restaurant? Or can I eat the peanut butter and jelly sandwich that I packed? Am I going to snap at that person? Or am I just going to, I'm going to force myself to stay silent, even though it feels like martyrdom, not saying something to that employee or, or coworker. That's the fight, that, that rage that you feel, that, that, that wanting to eat the hamburger instead of eating your peanut butter and jelly. The not saying the thing to your coworker, instead remaining silent. The death that you feel inside, it is that dying to self. And this is where the battle between the flesh and the spirit comes in. Unless we do the battle between the flesh and the spirit, you will never become an image of Christ. And that's what manliness is. One who can dominate his flesh. Now, a man, meaning a human being, has the ability, an intellectual creature, has the, has the ability to run until he dies. Even though he can't anymore, he can say, I'm going anyways. He can, he can, he can not eat until he dies. He can decide not to eat again. Animals can't do that. Mm -hmm. They don't eat because they have a dysfunction. They won't run until they die unless you force them. Mm -hmm. We can do it. We can choose to do certain. I'm not saying not, don't eat until you die. What I'm saying is we have the ability to overcome the flesh. Mm -hmm. And if we don't overcome the flesh, we will not make it to heaven. One thing dominates in this world, and whatever dominates is your eternity. Your soul either dominates your flesh or your flesh dominates your spirit. If your flesh dominates your spirit, hell will be yours for eternity, and your spirit will be dominated by the flesh for all eternity. It'll be immovable in hell, right? Tormented. Whereas if your spirit dominate your flesh like saint francis strove to do with his every breath what saint paul did with his every breath what our lord shows us though he didn't have to dominate his flesh he showed us he shows us in his vigils in his fasts and mm -hmm. walking until he's exhausted and the falling asleep in the middle of a storm and just waking up and be like what's everybody worried about but 
All, all of this, he's showing us how we're supposed to dominate these things so that our resurrection is like his resurrection. That's why the body is glorified afterwards, because it's dominated by the soul. But that's what your life is. When you look at the very end of what life is, the very end of what life is, did, you, did the soul win the battle or did the flesh win the battle? Will you be forever in eternity dominated by the flesh or will your spirit dominate your flesh? Will your, will your flesh participate in the glory of heaven? And that's what, the, that's what the work of manliness is. It isn't whether you can shoot guns. It's good that men are able to protect their families. And even nowadays, they have a lot of men at church that are able to protect the whole church. Mm -hmm. These are good, virtuous things. Men stepping up saying, this is my job. God, God made me a protector. I have to do that. Give me the leader. Though it's difficult, it's my job to lead my family. It's my job to lead them in prayer. It's my job to discipline the family. These are all beautiful things. But first and foremost, a man has the duty to become holy. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't become holy, then his children don't know how to become holy. And his wife, need, she deserves to have somebody who there is. It's holy. Women are, women are drawn to holiness. And if the men were holy, the women would become so much more holy because women are, they, 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 many women are able to, this is why so many of the women are mystics. Mm -hmm. They're able to tend towards this holiness. If they're led by men who are holy, the whole society will just start to change and become holy. This is the duty of men. And this is the essence of masculinity or manliness is to excel in the virtues. And if we did that, we would change everything. You mentioned two guys, St. Francis and St. Joseph, who are great models of manliness. And society, modern-wise, has turned Francis into uh, basically a hippie. And St. Joe is a uh, guy. Yeah. So what, are you, do you see that as the, basically, this might be a softball, as the direct attack against manliness for those two guys that he turned that way modern in modern times? Yeah, with St. Joseph, some of that stuff comes from um, the apocryphal Gospels. They, what they were doing back then, long time ago, they're just trying to preserve Our Lady's purity. They're trying to show in an image that they're, they're, you know, there was a purity thing there. But, but we know that, that that's not a problem if you have somebody who is already desirous of virginity. We already have other examples. With St. Joseph, I, I, I don't know. I think there's probably a, kind of an honest mistake there a lot of times for making him this old guy but with saint francis there was a direct attack mm -hmm. first they attacked our lord and the in what they what we talk about is it's that it comes from the historical critical method it's 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 the separation of the individual of the historical and the spiritual the the, the man of faith and the man of history the the, the jesus of faith and the jesus of history mm -hmm. Same thing with St. Francis, because if they did it with our Lord, they had to do it with St. Francis, because St. Francis is the perfect image of our Lord. So the St. Francis of history and the St. Francis of uh, of the faith. And this all comes from a, he was a Protestant, they say he was a Mason too, but he was at least a Protestant theologian uh, named Paul Sabatier. And he, 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 he just destroyed the person of St. Francis. He's really the one that turned St. Francis into a Protestant revolutionary and a uh, and, uh, a green peace guy, you know? And so that's where you get this idea of St. Francis. But unfortunately, most Franciscans take him for that. I did a Franciscan, I did a pilgrimage in California, and I stayed at um, a Franciscan friary there out in the middle of the mountains. You know, it was beautiful there. But it was right after the Laudato Sea, oh, man. I don't know, or whatever that was that Pope Francis wrote. Yeah. And, um, and so... I got there and I'd walk 35 miles that day and I got to this place and I, I could barely, I, it was late and I, I was half dead. And, and they, they, they took me around, they showed me the place and they gave me something to eat. As we're sitting there talking, it was late, they said, yeah, we, do, we got all this beautiful nature around here and all this, they're going on and on about nature and mm -hmm. stuff. And then he goes, so we, we've renamed our community the Laudato Sea Community. And then there was a silence because they all started staring at me. There's a couple of brothers at table and, and I'm eating. And I was like, what am I going to say? And then right, right at that moment, an owl, there was an owl outside. He goes like, hoo, 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 hoo. I was like, an owl. 
And then everybody goes, oh, beautiful. So I just kept eating. <laughs> what are you going to say? But it's just this idea that. I would have been laughing. And going, oh, no, you guys are really through it. <laughs> And so he's the St. Francis of integral ecology now. So they separate him from virtue, and you see him as this guy that's just this free-loving, likes to sing in the forest and play with butterflies. And St. Saint, Saint Francis, um, like I said, they called him the, ap- the, 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 ap- the Catholic and apostolic man. Those are big words. <laughs> Catholic and apostolic man. I mean, he lived a crucifixion. He was the first one to ever receive the stigmata. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an incredibly heroic life that he lived. He only wanted to live exactly like our Lord because our Lord lived that way. And that's why poverty. He lived poverty because our Lord lived poverty. And if our Lord lived poverty, then that's the best way to live. It's glorious, he said. So you've got to, you've got to take all that away from St. Francis, and you've got to put the focus on something else. And so now the focus is on, you know, multi-religions and trees, and there's always deer and stuff there. They never show him as this man of prayer. He was a seraph of prayer yeah. and a, of, of complete penance. He, he had to apologize to his body before he died because he, he knew he punished himself too much. What are some good books on Francis to read? The best book on St. Francis to read would be by St. Bonaventure. Okay. I mean, that's the, cause that's the, probably the most theological, but when you read it, it doesn't seem theological in the least bit. You can get it free online. I've been meaning to put it up on the website. I just haven't gotten to it yet, but you can eat. I mean, if you want to buy a copy online, they like you got these reprint places that you, know, you can get it for like seven bucks or something like that. But it's the major life of St. Bonaventure. But the original life of St. Francis was written by Blessed Thomas of Chalano. And that book was Thomas of Chalano knew St. Francis. He was one of the original companions, mm-hmm. not original 12, but within his lifetime, he knew St. Francis and the Pope commissioned him to write it. So you're getting, you know, you're getting eyewitness accounts of who St. Francis was. That's a really good book. But I really encourage the one of St. Bonaventure because St. Bonaventure, it's not a long book, but he's, not only telling you about the life of St. Francis, he's, he's showing you the theology behind St. Francis. He's, he's showing you that what his stigmata meant. He was given the stigmata because he perfectly imitated Christ. Christ stamped his flesh. It was like a stamp of approval. This is what it means to follow me. And he, he was given the stigmata. And that's, that's something to show all of us. Follow Christ is to be crucified, not, not just to say we're crucified with Christ, to allow ourselves the heartache and the tears. We have to remember that weeping is not contrary to manliness. Mm-hmm. Weeping is not contrary to joy. Mm-hmm. We, we get broken in this life from the spiritual agony and torment of being in this veil of tears. And when we kneel down at nighttime, we can feel in complete joy of the fact that God has allowed this to befall me, but I'm still a weak human and tears flow down my face because I feel broken from it. Mm-hmm. Nothing, there's nothing contradictory between hardship and suffering and joy in the service of God. And that's what, that's what the Christian manly life is, whether it's male or it's female. We all face this. When you're younger, you're a millennial. You're not used to it yet. But by the time you start getting middle age, around middle age, you've already faced all kinds of hardship. You realize you're not going to change the world. Everything they told you in high school is a lie. And now you're abandoned by half of your friends, most of your family, and nobody cares about you except God. And he's the only one you don't care about. You brought up a this is the life. I'm sorry, go that's, that, that's just kind of the way we find ourselves, the way we, if we don't lead the spiritual life, if we don't spend time meditating and praying, not just saying our prayers, saying the rosary, which you should say a lot of rosaries every day, but not just saying the couple of prayers you say in the morning and at night. You should be saying those prayers, but you need to take 15, 20, 30 minutes, an hour and be alone with our dear blessed Lord, because nobody finds a woman or a woman finds a man and they get married and say that they love each other without getting to know each other. 
And that means spending time with each other. And when you look at older people and they go to, I don't know, some restaurant and they're sitting there across from each other, if they don't have those stinking phones, they don't say a word to each other because they've been married for 50 years. They don't have a word to say to each other. But they're not at all perturbed by the fact they don't have anything to say because they know everything, one about the other. They've lived a life of union. What do you say to somebody who's your own flesh? They don't have to say anything. They're there with each other. And that's what we want to do with our Lord. We want to be of one flesh with our Lord. He's our spouse. He's our brother. You know, he, he, St. Francis shows it in Christ. He's our brother. He, he becomes our spouse. He is our father. And so we want to spend time with him. That's what our meditations have to be. And we've got to make, make time to do it. If we get to 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, and we start going to our spiritual director and asking, but what, what, what should I do to pray more? The thing is, it's really hard by the time you get to that age. How to do it now? 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour? Spend it with our Lord. You don't have to say anything. You just tell him you love him. Yeah, that was another practical uh, way to grow in virtue. Uh, you mentioned the alarm clock. What other ideas for someone just starting? I mean, you were basically reading off of like uh, what Jocko Willick and his uh, extreme ownership says, you know, have, create discipline, you know. Yeah. So don't don't hit the, don't hit the snooze button. Get up, do your morning prayers. Start working out. Yeah, have yourself. A <laughs> it doesn't yeah. mention the prayer thing. I threw that in there. <laughs> well, some of the things I talk to the kids about. An example I use all the times, <clears throat> like pizza. Everybody knows you get a you get a box of pizza in front of you. You know you only need need two slices, but instead you eat half the box of pizza because yeah. pizza's good. Yeah. But you know you only need to eat the two. So before you start eating the pizza, you need to say body, brother, ass. Mm -hmm. The kids love it when you talk about brother, ass. Yeah. Brother, ass, you're having two slices of pizza. And then you, you keep to it. You make brother, ass, you give him two pieces of pizza, and you don't give him anything else. Uh, in the morning time, you set your alarm, pray to your guardian angel, and when that alarm goes off, when your body says, hit it again, you have to tell brother, ass, I told you you're getting up. Mm -hmm up you make the sign of the cross and you bounce out of bed i don't you know you, you, we get up at one o'clock in the morning 12 30 12 30 and pray for an hour and then go back to bed that's not easy pick up I mean, actually it's not real hard but when you wake up you force yourself out of bed you just jump up you find yourself sometimes like bouncing off the walls because you're not awake yet but the thing is you told your body to get up even though it wasn't awake yet we have the ability to do that that's what you need to do. You need to look at all the aspects of your life. Where are you allowing your body? You tell yourself to do something and then you don't do it. You justify it. You say, well, it is a day. I have been tired. You go through this little thing. When you start doing that, you got you to identify it and say, no, brother ass, you're going to do what I tell you to do. You're, 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 not, you're not going to lay back down. You're not going to eat another piece of pizza. You know, you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not going to whatever it is. Uh, keep pulling the phone out and holding it in your hand or, or whatever. You, you're going to do what I tell you. But to do that, it means penance. It means living a life of penance. You've got to do, you've got to do penance. Yeah, there's, I mean, you brought up the phone thing. Here's one. Uh, if you have the, uh, the uh, not the vibration, so it makes a sound. You, know, you got the, was it Pavlov's dog thing? When you hear the, the bell, they, they immediately turn. Don't yeah. turn. <laughs> let it, let yeah. it ride for a minute. And, you 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 might go in convulsions. <laughs> yeah, who, who is I had a good I had a good deacon tell me that has something to do with. There's a psychology behind it. It's the same psychology they use for um, slot machines. Mm -hmm. You're always waiting for something to come. Maybe it's going to be that next thing's going to make you happy. So you you hear the ding or whatever, and you look, and you see, oh, you know. Then you start scrolling. Next thing you know, you're lost because you're you're engaging yep. your lower faculties. Yeah, Father, I think Father Art talked about that. He said there's been a study that we've lost two or three minutes of memory because of the, the phones. Um, I don't know. Something like that. Yeah. It's, yeah, it messes up with people's minds. But yeah, you get lost and you know, on Facebook for an hour and a half and you ain't done anything. Yeah. You've forgotten to eat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, anything else you can say, final words on manliness for anybody that we didn't cover? The, the thing about, the last thing I would say is, to, and, I, and I've already said it, but to arrive at all this, a man must pray. Mm -hmm. 
us pray. And I don't mean just saying a bunch of prayers. A man needs to, the children need to see a man walking into the house after work and kneeling down in front of the altar that they've built for our lady and some of the other saints, whatever their devotions are there at the house. And he says his prayers, he recollects himself, and then he engages his family. They need to see that every day. They need to see a man of prayer because that's what men, that's what they're supposed to be. Uh, we, we know there's somebody who takes care of the family and it's not the husband. My, my proudest moment so far is uh, the early father. We were at a friend's house and uh, my kids, two, my oldest is two. And we go, ready? Right before, uh, right before dinner, at, we were at a friend's house. And the first one to do this was the two-year-old. I'm going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Friar, thank you very much for that. Uh, appreciate that. I hope, uh, hope that helps out a ton of people out there. And uh, definitely, again, we'll do something else down the road. All right. Wonderful. God bless you. You as well. Bye-bye. Bye, Medina.